Uh, good evening, I'm Dick Milius. I'm chair of Alaska Common Ground. I wanna welcome you to tonight's discussion of Alaska's new election system. We cannot conduct the work we do without the support of our members and donors. If you would like to support events like this, please consider becoming a member of Alaska Common Ground or make a donation online at akcommonground, all one word, dot org. A couple of housekeeping items. If you want to ask questions or provide feedback during the event, we are taking those through Zoom's Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I'll collect your questions and we will ask them after the panelists' presentations. If you see a question you like, you can upvote it. I've never done that before, so interesting to see how that turns out. Um, this event has been recorded in case you or your friends want to watch it later. The event will run till about 8.30. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. First up is Gail Fanumi, I, Fanumi, I, excuse me, Gail, is the director of Alaska's Division of Elections. She is a seasoned veteran of the Division of Elections serving nearly 17 years as an elections coordinator, information officer and elections program specialist. She was also a previously elections director from 2008 to 2015 and returned in January of 2019. Jason Gren is the executive director of Alaskans for Better Elections, a fourth generation Alaskan. Jason was born and raised in Anchorage and recently served as an independent state representative in the Alaska State House, where he led the fight on legislative ethics reform and championed economic development for Alaska. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gail. All right, thank you for having me here this evening. I'm going to just do a short PowerPoint presentation that explains the new primary system and the new general election rank choice voting system. And then I'll turn it over to Jason and he's going to talk a little bit about things from the Alaskans for Better Elections side. So I'm going to try to share my screen now, see if this works. You should see a blue screen. Can you see a blue screen? Do I get a nod? Yes, okay, good. <laughs> All right, so um, as, as stated before, this is a brand new system. Um, it's It was a citizen initiative, as all of you know, was voted on in the 2020 November general election. It won by a, about 3,781 votes, it made this um, initiative become law, which took effect in February of 2021. I'm trying to ma manage all my screens here, not doing very good. Um, <laughs> So the big differences for the primary is that there will be one ballot with all candidates appearing on the ballot. Same ballot regardless of political party affiliation, regardless of the voters party affiliation. And then the top four vote getters for each race will advance to the general election ballot. But we do like to make it clear that it is a still only a vote for one election in the primary. But the, if there's more than four candidates in the race, the top four will advance to the general election ballot. So ballot measure two, first, um, one of the requirements is that we make a note on the ballot to identify that the candidate is um, just because they have a party affiliation next to their name does not imply that they're nominated or endorsed by the political party or group. That's only indicates how the candidate is registered to vote with the Division of Elections. You'll see in this United States Senator sample ballot example that there are candidates, there are five candidates, and you'll see there they are of different political party affiliations appearing on the same race. If there's less than four candidates, then all three candidates will automatically, you know, obviously after the election is certified, move forward to the, the general election. Perhaps the biggest change for the primary election comes with the governor and lieutenant governor. They now run as a team in the primary election, whereas in the in the former system, 
there was a race for governor and a race for lieutenant governor. And the top vote getter for party A was paired with the top vote getter for party A for, from governor for lieutenant governor. And then they ran together in the general election. This time they run together as a team in the primary. So the big changes again, um, one thing I didn't talk about was there is no nominating petition process, which means in order to appear on the general election ballot, you have to run in the primary unless you decide to um, only run as a write-in, which are still allowed. Um, the candidate chooses their affiliation that appears on the ballot and the governor and lieutenant governor run together as a team. So now we'll move on to the ranked choice voting aspect, which will, we first were talking about this, that it will first take place in the November general election, but things have changed and voters will have their first opportunity to participate in a ranked choice voting election in the August primary for, this, for the vacancy created by the, um, the passing of Representative Congressman Young. So this, uh, just some quick um, snippets. The general election prior was operated under plurality, meaning that the winner took all. It didn't matter if they had 10% or 15% or if they had just 25%. It was most votes won. As you can see, the same um, informational heading about the candidates designated affiliation is appearing on this ballot. Um, candidates appear on the ballot in rows, and then there are columns that go down on the right-hand side for voters to fill in an oval next to the choice they are designating for each candidate. Um, you do not have to rank all races. If you just want to rank your first choice only, that's completely allowed. If you um, choose to rank two or three, that is also, it's all voter initiated voter options. Of course, the judicial measures and any um, judicial candidates and any ballot measures will appear as yes, no votes as they have in the past. So now we'll just kind of give a, I'll give a few demonstrations about what happens if you mark your ballots in um, a certain way. So as I mentioned before, it's a, it's a grid-like ballot where the candidates are listed in rows on the left and the number rankings are in columns on the right. And we've shown this as a, gets a green check because this is what, you know, a, um, a ballot that is voted correctly where there is one oval for each candidate in a column. You don't see any candidates being voted for in the, more than one first choice taking place on this ballot. So this would be, in this ballot, Chick Hicks is this voter's first choice. And if by chance Chick then gets eliminated um, in round one, because there were no candidates that received 50% plus one, then Heather would then be the candidate that would get the vote in the second round. What I'm showing here is what we call an overvote. And if if a can if you vote in this manner where you give all number one rankings to each candidate, none of the none of this will count for for any of the candidates because the division's not able to determine voter intent. So we really are stressing please don't vote like this because you will, have a, you will have exhausted your opportunity to have cast a valid ballot for this particular race. It doesn't invalidate the whole ballot, it just invalidates the race in which the overvote took place. In this example, the law does not allow two sequentially skipped rankings. So in this example, candidate A would receive a first choice vote. And if by chance candidate, whenever candidate A got, gets eliminated in the subsequent rounds, this ballot is then deemed exhausted because they, the law says you cannot skip two sequentially ranked in a row. 
Another example, although this would be a valid ballot because we would be able to determine voter intent that candidate A obviously is this voter's first choice. However, if candidate A gets eliminated at some point, even if, if it's in the first round, the next valid marking on this ballot would go to candidate B. So essentially candidate B becomes this voters in this hypothetical situations, um, second choice. So now we'll talk a little bit about the tabulation process, a very simplistic example. Um, we have to 20 total votes and this requires 11 votes for the candidate to win. So we have four candidates, A, B, C, and D. And these are the numbers as they appeared after counting first choice votes in round one. The 50% plus one vote is this dotted line over here. And it's obvious by this example that no one achieved that. And so the candidate with the least number of votes is candidate C with three. And so in round two, the second choice votes on those ballots are going to get distributed to the remaining valid three candidates. So in this example, we hypothetically just said, one is gonna to go to candidate A, one's gonna to go to candidate B, and one's gonna to go to candidate D. Now the law says that the tabulation rounds continue after round one, if no candidate receives 50% plus one vote until there are only two candidates remaining and that the candidate with the most votes win. So we have still three candidates remaining, so we're gonna continue the tabulation. And in this example, in round two, candidate D had the least number of votes, a total of five. So then now the third choice votes on those ballots get distributed to the remaining two candidates. And in this situation, we just hypothetically assigned four to candidate B and one to candidate A. And so there's two candidates left. Candidate B has the most votes and is declared the winner. So what you can expect from the division of elections um, when there's a ranked choice election is that on election night, and this example talks about the the November 8th general election, as I said, this is how we were explaining this to people prior to the, the need to fill the vacancy for Representative Young. But um, the same situation will happen in the August election for that one specific race. On election night, we're gonna count all first choice votes. We decided as a team at the division that this would be the best thing for us to do because this is the first time we are implementing ranked choice voting. And we felt it was easier just to explain the process when the tabulation is done at the very end after the last possible absentee and qu or question ballots are counted. And by state law, we have up to 15 days for that to happen. And that did not change as a result of ballot measure number two. So between election day and day 15, we're gonna continue to, to count and update and produce reports unofficial results showing the first choice votes for all candidates for all races. And then on day 15 post-election, we'll look at all the races and determine which ones did not meet the 50% plus one vote threshold. And then we will do the tabulation process. And the tabulation process itself actually does not take very long at all. It's a very quick procedure and we are um, developing the, the report pages that we will be presenting to the public, but there are reports that will show round by round what happens, who got eliminated and where those votes went to the remaining candidates. So those are the types of reports we will, we plan to produce on, um, on day 15. And then of course, after the election on day 15, then the state review board will go through and conduct their review and audit of the election and no results will be certified until they have completed that. So that's the, um, the quick and dirty of um, the top four primary nonpartisan primary and ranked choice voting. And I will now turn it over to Jason. 
Hey, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Really appreciate the time, especially on a sunny day here in Anchorage, um, to uh, sit down and learn about these important changes coming to our, our election system much sooner, uh, much sooner than we thought uh, originally. But uh, thanks to the Division of Elections for all of their uh, leadership and, and great decision making on how to move forward. Um, really appreciate um, them, uh, you know, leading the way on, on these changes and um, our, our group. Alaskans for Better Elections um, has uh, uh, focused on supplementing those efforts, really working across uh, the state. We were zigzagging everywhere to every region and every every place we can, uh, presenting the sharing this information. So really appreciate uh, you taking the time to learn this information so that you can cor uh, uh, correctly share the information to your friends and neighbors, coworkers and such. I'm going to share my screen. We've got another uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation. And if you get your phone ready, uh, if you'd like to, we're going to do a quick mock election uh, here at the end of my presentation. Very, very quick. You don't have to sign up for anything. There's no ads, no, no, no high pressure or anything. Uh, just a really fun way to show you how easy it is to rank. So um, uh, again, uh, our group with Alaskans for Better Elections, uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit, which means um, we are completely nonpartisan. We don't support a party or candidates or endorse anything like that. Uh, our goal really is to work with voters and organizations across the state to make sure that the correct information gets out there. Um, and so uh, one of the questions we get asked a lot, I'll cover this, is why these changes, uh, why did uh, groups and individuals think that these changes need to happen? I'll review the uh, the two big changes uh, that Gail went over uh, so well, but just a few more details. And then uh, encourage you and inspire you, hopefully, to find some ways that you can help spread the word and so that every voter has the correct information uh, before we vote here, uh, here in the next uh, few weeks, actually, but also this fall. So one of the problems we had uh, in Alaska, if, if you've been voting here in the last 20 years, we've had a, a closed primary system or, or a semi-closed primary system. For a long time, Alaska actually had an open primary system, but in the year 2000, we changed to the system uh, that we had up until the year 2020. And what was happening was that with more than 60% of Alaskan voters not affiliating with one of the two major parties, about 63% of Alaskans actually don't belong to uh, either Republican or Democrat party, um, they were being excluded from participating in the primary election by having to disclose their party affiliation, um, seeing, uh, not seeing the candidates that they wanted to vote for on a ballot. Um, and that was, uh, you know, that can turn people away from wanting to vote or being confusing if they wanted to vote for a certain person who wasn't on their ballot. And so now in this open primary system, and I'll explain more here in a moment, but now in our open primary system, all Alaskan voters will be uh, really uh, voting from the same team. We also had uh, very, very common um, around the United States is plurality elections, uh, first past the post elections. Really, what that means is whoever receives the first most, uh, the whoever receives the most votes wins. Uh, and Gail explained that in our old system, you could win with 35, 40, 45 percent. And in fact, in our state, uh, often uh, we were seeing people win elections without the majority support of their district or their state. Uh, seven governors have won uh, in Alaska without receiving 50% of the, of the vote of the people. And in fact, uh, since 2002, no U.S. senator has won more than 50% of the vote. And so in our state's history, with a long uh, history of viable third-party candidates, independent candidates, write-in candidates, uh, switching to a ranked choice voting system uh, hopefully will be more uh, representative of what the people wishing and will send people to Juneau and send people to D.C., who have the majority support of their district or their state. So what is our group doing right now? Uh, just like the division elections, um, we are both working on implementation and the education process. Uh, implementation of all of these changes uh, means uh, things like software upgrades. Uh, just like when your phone needs an update or it's got some new, new information, you have to go through a software upgrade. Same thing with our uh, uh, ballot machines. Uh, regulations, our state statutes need to be updated and go through a public comment process, make sure that teaser T's are crossed, I's are dotted, make sure that the intention of the law is doing what's now on the books. Uh, several communities around our state, in fact, I think uh, over 100 communities around the state, we're still using hand counting uh, with ballots uh, after election night. And so new tabulators are purchased uh, for some of those communities so that the process can be done uh, more transparently and, and uh, done quicker. And then obviously uh, our group and, and many other groups are working with the Department of Law and Division Elections to make sure this information is getting out uh, both correctly and uh, informally. As I said, the education process is done entirely nonpartisan. Um, we are doing it in a way that is hopefully interactive, presentations like this, community events, uh, and through every uh, region of the state, uh, working with dozens of organizations, uh, hundreds of individuals. Uh, our group has interacted 
and uh, kind of deploying information through groups like the AERP, the Alaska Municipal League, get out the native vote, uh, and all sorts of other nonprofits and civic minded organizations, even for profit and other nonprofit groups um, who are in different communities around the state, just giving them the correct information so that every voter knows about how to fill out their ballot correctly. So the two big changes, um, as Gail went through, the first change is our new open primary system. An open primary system basically means is that you as a voter, you don't have to declare your part of party affiliation to participate. Every Alaskan will receive the same ballot depending on where they live. And you don't have to ask for a certain ballot and you will see all the candidates on that ballot. And you can vote for any candidate regardless of your party affiliation and regardless of their party affiliation. Now you have the freedom to be able to vote for who you want in the primary election. You can see here on the map, primary, uh, open primaries are actually quite common throughout the United States. Um, there's over 30 states that use an open primary system. You can see that uh, Washington and California have a little bit darker shade of that orange. Uh, they use a, a similar system to Alaska. What they use is a top two nonpartisan open primary system. Uh, what they were finding in Washington, California is often the top two candidates who move on to the general election are of the same party. And if you're not uh, a, uh, uh, registered with that party or you don't agree with that platform and you see two of the other party on as your only options, it might keep you from voting. Um, it might keep you um, from uh, being part of the process. And so in Alaska, going through the ballot measure process, uh, decided that a top four nonpartisan open primary system would open up for more choices, would open up for uh, a better, uh, uh, better candidates who would reflect the district and be uh, uh, and work in a way that they have to work with all voters. And that's where ranked choice voting comes in as well. And I'll explain that here in a moment. But as you can see, open primary is very common throughout the United States. Um, as I've mentioned, as Gail's mentioned, all voters will be using the same primary ballot, depending on where they live, obviously. And you select one candidate, just one candidate in each race, regardless of their party affiliation, regardless of your party affiliation, you get to select one candidate and vote for who you'd like best. And then the top four vote getters move on to the general election. Uh, and as Gail mentioned, if there's only two or three or four, all of those candidates once certified would move on to the general election. But if there's five or six or seven, which we're seeing in, in several races, like the governor's race, US Senate race, um, that only the top four will move on. They'll move on to the general election where change number two takes place. Change number two in our elections is the ranked choice general elections. And Gail did a great job of showing those ballots and, and kind of how the tabulation works after election night. But ranked choice voting as a voter, all you need to worry about is how you want to rank your candidates. And you rank them in an order of the preference that you would like, one, two, three, or four. You can rank as few candidates as you would like, or you rank as many candidates as you'd like, and your, and your ballot will still be valid. We tell people when we're doing these presentations that we would never encourage you or tell you to vote for someone uh, and show a preference for someone who you don't want to. Uh, there's no way that um, you should feel compelled that you have to fill out the complete ballot if you don't like those candidates. But we do encourage people to utilize the power of ranked choice voting. As a voter, you have now a different power than you have in the past. You get to select people one, two, three, four. And it's, it's just like when you go out to a restaurant or you go shopping or you're trying to find a movie with a group of people, it's about that order of preference of a maybe a love to a like to an okay to a no way. Or maybe you like all three or four, you can rank them accordingly. But again, you as a voter have the power now to rank and choose a candidates in your preference. Uh, this map sometimes surprises people when we say, where is ranked choice voting used around America? Well, it's been used in Australia for about 100 years, and it's used in Ireland and Scotland and other countries around the world. But even here in America, it's getting more and more momentum and being used as we speak around the United States. Um, you can see Maine is the only other state that uses it. But uh, southern states like Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia use it for their military and overseas voters. 23 cities in Utah just used it for the first time this fall. New York City used it uh, this past summer for their mayor's race. And then other cities like Minneapolis, Santa Fe, San Francisco, and other cities uh, around the United States use it. Um, and other organizations use it. The Utah Republican Party uses it for their nominating process for their governor. Same with the Virginia Republican Party. They use it um, uh, through their nominating, nominating process. They just used it this past fall. And uh, Governor Yunkin actually won. And he was actually nominated through the ranked choice voting process with the Republican, uh, Repub Republican Party of Virginia. 
So again, uh, being used in multiple ways in multiple jurisdictions around the United States. But, um, but Alaska is the only place that will be using a top four open primary system combined with a ranked choice voting general election. Uh, just a really quick reminder, how do we use our ballot? It's as simple as one, two, three. Step one, choose your top candidate. That's your first choice candidate. And that's who we want you to be excited about and fill in that, that bubble next to their name in that first column. If you have a second choice, again, not required, but we want you to find ways to utilize that ballot, you just have to select another candidate. It just has to be different from your first, your first choice candidate. And then step three and step four, again, uh, if, you find, if, you be, if you're compelled to, to rank a third and fourth candidate, just make sure that they're different than uh, the bubble you fill in is different than your first and second candidate. Uh, again, we can't de declare a winner um, until all of the votes are in. Uh, as Gail showed, you, you uh, uh, get to that 50% plus one and be declared the winner by sometimes you have to eliminate candidates. And we don't want to do that early. And uh, Gail and Division Elections have a great setup. And um, once those uh, ball uh, ballots are certified and races are certified, they'll show that round by round vote total released to the public in a uh, completely transparent way. And so, the vo so that the voters know who, um, who received the second place, uh, second round votes and third round votes uh, and so forth. So uh, really quickly, um, I think we've got, we've got some time. Uh, I'm probably talking too fast and we're getting through this quickly, but if you wanna open up your camera on your smartphone and just um, scan that QR code, don't have to take a photo or anything, you should get a, a web browser popping up. And in that browser, it'll go to a, a rankedvote.com uh, website and we are going to pick the favorite season, uh, our best season. So this is winter, spring, fall, and summer, uh, something that you might debate in your own house or in your neighborhood or, or at work, uh, people's favorite season around Alaska. And I'm, uh, I, about a week ago, I was not a fan of spring. Spring was really making me mad, uh, but today was pretty nice. So um, I guess I'll vote for spring, but um, rank your candidates one, two, three, four, or just one, two, or just one. And then you'll just find a submit button on the bottom of that page. And you don't, again, don't have to select everyone, but hit submit and it'll say, thanks for your vote. And if you hit the preliminary results button, it's gonna show you, let's see. And if you refresh it a few times, we're getting more and more votes in. But again, you need that 50% plus one to win. So right now we're up to 30 votes, 31 votes. 32, 33, so we're getting a few in here. That's great. Now, as Gail said, if someone, if a candidate receives 50% plus one in the first round, they're the winner. There's no need to go to the second round or third round. But if no one receives that 50% plus one in the first round, that's where the importance of the second and third rankings come into play. So let's uh, refresh this one more time. Looks like I'm up to 36 votes, 37 votes. And if you scroll down just a little bit, you'll see, it looks like summer is going to win, but it did take until round two for summer to win. Uh, you need 19 of the 37 votes, uh, says my browser. Let's see, 38 votes, so you need 20. All right, and you can see summer was close in that first round, but they needed the support of some of the other second round um, uh, choices from other people to, be, uh, to go past that 50% threshold. If you scroll down that page a little bit, you can kind of see there's more information about uh, what does a round mean and, and how many votes to win? How's that calculated? Things like that. And you can kind of see more details on everything. Um, it's kind of just a fun way um, to get more information and kind of see the process happen. So some of the benefits of ranked choice voting, especially from a, from a voter standpoint, is that one, it eliminates the spoiler effect. Um, if you've ever voted in a race and there's three candidates or maybe even four candidates, and you have to pick what sometimes people are called the lesser of two evils, or uh, you're told not to waste your vote on a, a third party candidate or a, a lesser known candidate. With ranked choice voting, that is eliminated because now you can vote for that third party candidate or a lesser known candidate, because if they're eliminated in the first round, you still have your second place vote ready to go with a uh, maybe a, a more major party front runner or someone that you uh, don't mind being second. But with that said, it also encourages those campaigns to engage all voters. Uh, as you can see in our mock election with summer, you needed the support of those second and third place votes to win. And so as a candidate, if I can't get 50% plus one in that first round, well, what do I do? I have to find ways to engage with those other campaigns, those other candidates and their voters to ask for their second place vote, their third place vote. And so now I'm, as a candidate, reaching out to more voters than maybe I'm used to, or maybe voters who 
aren't part of my party registration, aren't part of my party, but I need to talk to them because I, I need that second place vote. And it also, like I said, it ensures those winners get the majority support of voters, not the, not the majority of first place votes, but the majority support of the voters from each district or state. As we've said, for candidates, they have to work towards a majority, not just a plurality. And so it, it, they have to build really a combination of a strong first place choice support, but then they have to find common ground and earn that second place, third place vote from other candidate supporters. So you'll see things like negative advertising tends to decrease in these jurisdictions with ranked choice voting because uh, you don't want to see, you know, get something in the mail that trashes your number one candidate. And then on your doorstep the next day, another candidate says, hey, I'd like to earn your second place or maybe even your first place vote, but you just got a mailer from them trashing your favorite person. How likely would you be as a voter to engage with that candidate and give them a second place vote? So you, you tend to see negative advertising decrease. Uh, you, uh, many jurisdictions have seen campaigns sometimes run together saying, hey, if you don't uh, rank me number one, I'd like to see your number two. And this person, this other candidate, same thing. If you can't vote for them, vote number one, vote for them number two. So you see some more compromise. So what it does is it rewards candidates and rewards elected officials to work across the aisle, to find ways of, common, of earning common ground from other voters and finding ways through the competition to earn those second and third place votes. Uh, again, just to really recap, obviously our elections are changing this year and we're working incredibly hard with the division elections and all sorts of other groups to prepare and educate Alaskans. Change number one with that open primary, uh, we hope to see an increased participation because of um, some of the, the gates are now open for people to vote how they like. All candidates will appear on that ballot. You'll see uh, candidates, Republicans, Democrats, everyone on the same ballot. The top four vote getters move on regardless of their party affiliation. You could have two Republicans, two Democrats, three Republicans and one Democrat. Any combination of those top four vote getters will move on to the, to the general election where Alaskans will be using ranked choice voting where you as a voter get to rank your candidates in, the, in an order of your preference, one, two, three, four, or just one, two, or just one. And the, the winner will receive majority support, that 50% plus one, uh, when they go to Juneau or DC. And all of this counting, all of this work will be done transparently through the division elections uh, uh, work that they're, that they're uh, preparing now. Uh, just really quick, as, uh, as mentioned, uh, just some dates, uh, reminder dates. Uh, June 11th, the uh, special primary election to uh, replace uh, the late Congressman Don Young is being held by mail. Uh, Gail can speak to this, but hopefully ballots are uh, starting to uh, leave the mail, uh, the post office uh, tomorrow. And uh, you, you probably will receive these in the next week or so. Um, that is a vote uh, by mail election. Again, in that, that ballot will have 48 candidates and you only pick one person. And then it's got some instructions on there, like you need a witness, um, but the postage is paid by the, by, uh, by the state of Alaska. So hopefully a very simple, straightforward process, uh, except for maybe having only to pick one person. Uh, that might be hard for some people. But again, uh, you'll receive that ballot in the mail, pick just one, and then pop that back into the mailbox by June 11th. August 16th, we will have a special general for that U.S. House replacement seat that will be using ranked choice voting. And we'll be voting on the regular primary election, which means on one part of your ballot, you'll be ranking for one race, and the other part of your ballot, you'll be selecting just one for the other races. A little confusing, um, but we're getting the word out. I know Alaskans are really smart. Alaskans are going to figure this out, and poll workers are going to have all this information, and there'll be information uh, when you go vote to kind of explain this, I'm sure. And then on November 8th, the regular election for the, uh, all the, uh, the regular races will be using ranked choice voting as well. Uh, just in case you haven't seen it, um, this is what your ballot will look like when it comes in the mail. This is just a sample ballot. Um, it will might look different depending on where you live because the names um, do adjust based on each district. But uh, kudos to the division elections for uh, getting all of these names on, on one sheet of paper with uh, instructions on the top. Again, just vote for one candidate. Um, and it's an alphabetical order, so hopefully you can find the candidate that you like. Again, how can you help as, as community members, as, uh, as business leaders, as people who are involved with um, making sure that the uh, quality of life of, of your community increases and, and people are engaged with our elections? We want people to vote. And how do we, we, we get people to vote is by giving them the best information. So think about ways that you can share this information and, the, and different resources that are available with your family, friends, and coworkers or neighbors. Uh, maybe there's a presentation like this or, or hear from Gail for a presentation at, at your business place or your Rotary Club or any other group. Um, we, we've been doing a lot of presentations. I, we're, 
we're not done yet on, on, uh, on who we've been talking to because we've got a lot of ground to cover, but we've, we're, we're, we're spreading the word as best we can. So we're happy to do uh, presentations. I know the Division of Elections does an incredible amount as well, but um, you can request a presentation or other resources from us. And then making sure that you share the correct information, information that's been vetted from the Division of Elections. They have a tremendous amount of uh, uh, frequently asked questions and videos and sample ballots on their website. Uh, our website has a lot more information as well, but make sure that the information that you are sharing is correct and, uh, and factual. Again, thank you for the time. Really appreciate it. Um, this is my content information. I'll put this in the uh, in the chat, and I know uh, Alaska Common Ground can can pass this along to anyone who might like it. Uh, but happy to engage with people through email or text or phone call uh, to make sure that your questions are answered and that uh, the the correct information gets out to all Alaskans. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it, everyone, and uh, uh, ready ready for questions and answer time. Okay. Thank you, Jason and Gail. I have one quick question, which follows up on something Jason just said about the um, August 16th primary. Is that going to be two ballots or one ballot with both the um, ranked choice for the special election and the um, primary? Will that be one ballot or two? Well, originally, this is Gail. So originally, we, the division, were thinking about putting it on one ballot. We have not officially made that decision yet. One ballot is much easier to administer. Um, election wise. Um, so we are still looking into that. We're trying to determine what is going to make it the least confusing for the voters. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question uh, to this is specifically directed for Gail. I'm wondering if the state has coordinated in any way with the US Postal Service about the June mail in election. I understand that there were some problems with the local Juno elections because of postal handling. We are having weekly meetings with the USPS folks in Alaska and keeping them in the loop on the when the ballots are being mailed. In fact, they got mailed today. So they left the, um, the ballot printing house today. So as Jason said, I would think you could start expecting them in five to seven days. Um, and then we, we have a... Um, we also though require witnessing. So with a witness and a date that does help with the issue if there is no postmark on the ballot. But we also are encouraging voters to take their ballot if they want to the window at a post office and have the clerk put a hand cancel stamp on there. So it's guaranteed to get a postmark. But with a witness signature and a date, the division's policy is um, to count that ballot as long as it's received within that 10 day window, which is allowed for by statute if the witness date is on or before election day, if there's no postmark. I have a follow-up question on that. Will there, is there gonna be any drop boxes or places people can drop their ballots instead of mailing them like division of election offices? We will not be utilizing drop boxes because we do not have those and we don't have an adequate supply to equally distribute them across the state, but you can drop your ballot off at any division of elections office and any of the absentee or early voting locations that will be open starting 15 days before the election. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question coming in is for the general election for Congress in August, I'm registered in Anchorage, but I'll be between Skagway, Juneau and Haines in August. How can I vote away from home? Well, there's a couple ways you could do that. You could apply to get a by mail ballot. And if you have your address, it depends on the timing. Usually ballots for the primary are sent out about three weeks or so before the election. So there's a possibility it could reach you in Anchorage before you leave. Or if you happen to be in Juneau during that 15 day window before the election, there's early voting taking place at our region one election office here in Juneau that will have ballots for all 40 house districts. There's also the availability for you to vote um, electronically to receive your ballot by fax or by um, an online delivery system. So that's an option available to you as well, starting 15 days before the election. I presume for the, for the August um, election then, since those, there will be polling places, they could also vote a question ballot, is that correct? Correct. So though the August election will be your traditional in-person election. So if you have no option to get your actual house district ballot, you could vote in Skagway. You would vote a question ballot. Um, and if you're registered to vote Anchorage, your vote would count for statewide races only in that situation. So my, my suggestion would be apply for a ballot, 
and let's hope for the best that it gets to you before you leave Anchorage or you if say you have someone checking your mail for you, they could get it to you in Skagway or Juneau or come vote in person in, in Juneau during that 15 day window. Okay, the next question is, I didn't understand the tabulation process, particularly round two forward, namely how the second, third, fourth round rankings affect the totals. And this mixed with the spread of eliminated candidates votes doesn't make sense to me. Please help. I am confused. Okay, well, it is, it's, it's a complicated process until you really start talking about it a lot. So your first choice candidate, um, so depend, you know, there's rankings as Jason and I talked about, there's rankings one through four or five if you wanna vote for a write-in candidate. So say your first choice candidate gets eliminated and that candidate is no longer in the running. So you're gonna look at all the second choice votes on those eliminated, that, that eliminated candidates ballots. And then you're gonna distribute those amongst the remaining candidates. And that continues from round to round until you get to two or less, um, to remain in two candidates and then the candidate with the most vote wins. Could, Jason, I don't know if you have a, yeah, a you know, more eloquent way to. <laughs> I, I can show another example that, that sometimes we use um, um, just, just as another graphic way. Sometimes it just helps with, with more ways visually. Um, um, you, you can see here, this is, um, this is not based on our results, but this is in the mock election of winter, summer, fall and spring candidates. And you can see, um, again, looking at looking for that 50% threshold, no one received it in the first round. And so I think to the to the uh, to the person's question is, um, OK, if I voted for summer, where does my ballot go? Well, again, if we look at your ballot and go, OK, if you voted for summer number one and summer is now eliminated, whoever you ranked number two, that's where it's distributed. If you don't have a number two, your ballot is is now stopped. And your ballot doesn't go to anyone else. You, uh, you will, we, the ballot doesn't go to any candidate that you never vote for, that, you're, that you never support through, through preferential voting. But if you did have a second vote, you were summer, you voted for summer number one, it's eliminated. This is what happens next. So those votes are moved to based on who ranked who number two. So winter gained a few, fall gained a few. You can see here in this uh, example, spring gained quite a bit. But again, no one reached 50%. And so we have to do it one more time. So now who's in, who's in last place? Spring. You look at whoever voted for spring number one and you look at their ballot and go, who did they vote for number two? And we move on. Or if summer number one and they voted for spring number two, who did they rank number three? And we move on. And again, if you voted for spring number one and you don't have a number two, your ballot doesn't move. But for all the other ballots that had a number two or third choice, this is what happens. Spring is eliminated, and those those ballots are then moved to the appropriate candidate based on their their ranking. And then uh, winter gained quite a bit. Fall gained quite a bit more. Fall went past that fifty percent plus one threshold and would be de be declared the winner. I hope I hope that helped. Another explanation. It says di different different ways of of learning and sharing. Um, Sometimes videos, there's lots of videos on YouTube that, that people can Google. Um, the, the, the Division Elections website has, it, has more videos and kind of um, some other graphics too, if you, if you wanna learn and kind of do this on your own speed. But um, yeah, lots of information out there on how it works. Okay, next question is, do you anticipate a greater percentage of wasted ballots in the first ranked choice vote? Or I guess it'd be the first ranked choice election. You know, I really don't um, have expectations. I don't really know. Um, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know, Jason, if you have any historical knowledge based on what other, you know, localities have found when it comes to this. Yeah, that's a great question. Obviously, with a system change, um, people can be nervous about, uh, I want to make sure I fill this out correctly. Um, uh, or, you know, what happens if I, if I screw up, um, things like that. Um, and that's why you're seeing so much work happening from the division elections and ourselves and other organizations is we really want to get this information out um, to every voter and just in a very kind of informative way that people feel confident. And, and hopefully the first time they use that ranked choice ballot, it's not the first time they've seen it. Um, and that's why, you know, there's sample ballots available, uh, presentations like this available. Uh, many jurisdictions that have, as, when they've used ranked choice voting in the first time, um, it, they've seen either increases in correct ballots or a very negligible change in terms of a decrease of, of 
um, what you know, it's probably a correct term, Gail can help, but a ballot that gets invalidated or a race that gets invalidated. Um, there's, there's been you know, studies after studies in all of these uh, different jurisdictions, especially in America, that have used it. Um, and really, there's, there's no increase in um, quote unquote wasted ballots or people who uh, make a mistake and, and still submit that ballot. Um, and so um, I think in, you know, in, in New York, we used it this summer. They had over 98% of the ballots were deemed um, uh, valid and were counted. Uh, and that was on par with what they'd seen before. And so I think Alaskans are going to, uh, I'm crossing my fingers, but I think we can do good or as better uh, as New York City did. Kind of a, a related question would be that, that will the, like the voting machines, when you, if you feed in a ballot right now under the old system that had errors on it, it would often kick it back. If somebody voted like for all, ranked everybody first place, would the machine even accept that or would, and could they then correct that or would that just go into, I guess, how would the voting machine tabulate that? Voters will have an opportunity again to correct ballots. They will be rejected based on different scenarios like what you just described as an overvote. And so that ballot would be returned to the voter and say you have an overvote for you know, um, United States Senate race. And, and the voter will have an opportunity to correct that to return the, their ballot back to the board, spoil it and get a new ballot, or they can just say, no, that's what I wanted to do and, and just let it go through. So the voters will still have an opportunity to correct ballots that they don't catch a mistake on before they get it to the tabulator. Yeah, the next question up there is more of a comment. Um, going on to another question, at a four person rank choice vote, would there always be five possible choices to account for a write-in? Well, if there's, a, if there's four candidates that move forward from the primary, yes, there would be an opportunity for five rankings if there's a write-in candidate that filed for that race. Okay. This is a question for Gail. It is pretty unlikely, but in the strange event that there would be a three-way tie in a round, how would the coin toss work to determine a leader or would you be doing a coin toss to determine who would be considered the lowest candidate in order to redistribute votes for a next round? Well, the law provides for how ties are done in, in the actual rounds. And it's, um, it's, it's drawn by lot, I believe. Is that what it's? I can't remember exactly. I haven't looked into that recently, but the law prescribes how that's done. And so um, it, it's a drawing. And so I would just, we would put the candidate's name in a hat and then you draw out the winning candidate. Um, if there's a tie at the end, then that's done in a different manner through the, through the recount process. And then um, if there's still a tie, then it's done by lot. Okay, next question is, how are you going to ensure there's no fraud to happen with the special election? What is the statute for the special election and how long has this statute been in effect? Well, the statute is Alaska statute 152800, and I don't have the exact date how long that's been in effect, but it has been in effect for quite some time. Um, the division has, you know, multiple checks and balances. We know we're sending, we know who we're sending the ballots to. We know who to expect the ballots back from. We have ways to um, determine if a voter tries to attempts to vote more than once because we log ballots into our system. And if another ballot comes in from the same voter, we'll know that they've attempted to vote in more than one fashion. We have um, bipartisan boards that review the ballots. And then we have a bipartisan state review board that actually goes through and does the audit of the election. And in all my time um, working for the division, I've not seen um, fraud, fraud, fraud like that. If, if I may, Dick, really quick. Um... If you haven't, um, as a voter, or just a citizen of, of Alaska, um, you know, this was something obviously that I'm involved with and wanted to learn more about and was able to take a uh, tour of the facilities and learn more from the division elections on things that they do to make sure that um, our, our, our elections are done with integrity and done with security. It's, it's pretty quite amazing. Um, I really encourage people to find out more about it. You know, things like why paper ballots are used, why, uh, you know, ballot machines aren't connected to the internet. Uh, things like this, Gail and her team have, have really done a fantastic job of, of being transparent as possible and showing the public of, of kind of the chain of custody of how ballots move and everything. It's really quite impressive. And I, I really hope that people, if they have questions about uh, uh, voting and the integrity and security of things, you know, ask, ask division elections, you know, find a tour, or get more information. It's really, it's really quite cool. Um, 
uh, what they do and, and, and really in a lot of ways, leaders of, of the security process, even, even in the United States, it's, it's quite amazing. So uh, just wanted to give a kudos to, to the division of elections on that. And I'll actually make a personal pitch on that. I've worked as a, a precinct chair for one of the polling places for 12 years. And um, at least for the in-person elections, if people want to understand how they work better and have more trust in the system, volunteer to work at your polling place. There are always need workers. And that's a really good way to learn um, all the checks and balances that are in the system. Um, so like I say, the uh, Division of Elections is always looking for uh, people to work at polling places. Okay, next question. What happens if you choose two of the same candidates? If you choose to, in a, in a ranked choice voting election? I presume okay. so. Well, if you vote for two candidates in the primary, it will be an overvote, so your ballot won't count at all. If you choose two of the same candidates, so you mark two candidates the same ranking, um, in the example I showed, if you mark two candidates the same ranking, it's considered an overvote. You're not able to determine what the intent of the voter is. So the vote, the law says that at the point an overvote occurs, the ballot becomes inactive. And okay, then there's a comment. Thank you, Jason, for this opportunity. We should do more. I presume that means more presentations like this to educate people. So even though Jason's doing three a day and Gail probably the same. Um, the League of Women Voters in Fairbanks is using the state slideshow with permission and fair vote materials to make presentations to civic groups. Again, just a comment. Um, Gail, if you get five right in candidates with one vote each, how does that work with the rounds? Five write-in candidates with one vote each. Um, well, write-ins are, um, they, the process for counting write-in votes has not changed. So collectively, if write-in votes aren't the first, the top vote getter or the second vote getter within a certain percentage, I think it's like the difference between the two is like a half a percent, then they're eliminated as a group. And so they would be the first round eliminated after round one and then the second choice um, on those eliminated ballots would be distributed amongst the remaining candidates. There still is only if five candidates file as a write in for a seat though there's only one spot to write in your choice for a write in candidate though. Okay next question is what type of witness do we need and how is their identity confirmed? Um, a witness can be anybody over the age of 18. It does not have to be notarized. Um, and I mean, I'm just going to be honest and upfront. There is not a verification process for the witness. Um, we don't do signature verification either. Um, but the witness, we hope, is, is used more to, um, you know, deter voters from trying to commit fraud, which, again, I state that we have not seen in a by mail election situation at any time that I've been working for the division. But it is a requirement per statute. Okay, I think you just answered this next question. Will signatures on the ballots be validated? No, because there's no signature verification authority in statute to do that. Can a, and this is, I guess you answered this one. Can a family member be your witness for the ballot? I guess if they're 18, the answer would be. If you're 18, yes. Um, Don't take it to the post office and ask them to witness your ballot because they're not allowed to do that. Just want to put that out there too. <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, can you please explain how write-in votes are counted? Presumably write-ins will count as the lowest vote getters, assuming no candidate receives 50% after the first round. Are write-ins eliminated in the round process as a block or are they write-in vote getters eliminated individually? Um, I think I covered that earlier and they're, they're eliminated as a group. So then they're eliminated. If they're the lowest in round one, they get eliminated and then their second choice votes get distributed to the remaining candidates. Uh, what accommodations are being made for people who don't read English? Well, we are required to provide language assistance to those areas determined by um, Section 203 of the Federal Voting Rights Act. And we have bilingual poll workers, bilingual outreach workers. We have toll free um, language assistance numbers where people can call. We have a variety of materials that our language staff have worked on to translate um, that's on our website. We are doing direct mailings to voters in 
the language that their community is required to receive assistance in related to elections and specifically, you know, ranked choice voting and also for the special primary election. And we do public, you know, radio announcements in in translated languages as well. And we're doing uh, our group is doing a lot of work, as I mentioned, um, Dick, uh, groups like uh, Native Action Community Group, uh, get out the native vote. Uh, we're working with native corporations around the state uh, to work with their shareholder relations and, and different networks to get the, uh, you know, get this information out, but also being sensitive to understanding that uh, one, there's different languages and dialects around the state. As Gail's mentioned, some of those are required by law to provide information and, and ballots for, um, but really, you know, the goal is to make this as easy and as simple as possible. And some of that means language translation, and that's just kind of part of it all. And so um, a lot of the resource that, uh, that Gail mentioned and that we have um, very happy, if there's, if there's groups or, um, uh, you know, we're working with the Polynesian community of Anchorage for one, and we're gonna make a video that's that's in, um, you know, a language that's, that's much more easier for them to understand than English. And so um, lots of different things that are happening um, in different ways to make sure that, that every voter has access um, to information in, in a way that they can understand and learn. Okay, the next question is really actually more of a comment. Why can't your example of rank voting be shown on the o'clock news so more people can get educated? I presume it could be shown if <laughs> six o'clock news wants to do a story. I'm if sure they, they wanted to do a story, we'd be happy to show it. <laughs> okay, at the precincts in the August and November elections, will there be examples of incorrectly completed ballots along with an example of a correctly completed ballot? Yes, we plan to have information sheets there. So if a voter um, ballot is returned and they're not sure why, they can look at the sheet and determine what was the issue with their ballot to, per, you know, to allow them still to maintain their privacy of vote and not have to have the election official look at their ballot for them and explain to them what happened. Okay, the next one is for the 2020 election, the signature witness was removed for all absentee ballots and the chain of custody was destroyed. So how can you ensure this won't happen again? Why was the signature witness removed for the 2020 election? Well, there was a there was legal action filed against the state to um, due to COVID, I believe it was that um, to remove the witness requirement, and the court the court ruled in favor of the plaintiffs, and the signature requirement witness signature requirement was removed only for the 2020 general election. It is back in play. Um, all other chain of custody procedures remained in place for the for the November 2020 general election. The next one, how do you know when a ballot has a mistake? How do you know whose ballot it is and how long can you identify that my ballot is my ballot as it goes through the process? Well, um, we won't know your ballot has a mistake until it's opened and scanned by the regional counting board. So the process for when your ballot comes back in is it's, it's not opened until it goes through a, a review process. So the Division of Elections staff log the ballots. They're gonna remove the tab where it has your signature and your identifier and the witness signature. And they're gonna make sure those three things are there. They're gonna make sure the identifier matches the information that is in our voter registration system. And then it's gonna be logged as um, in this election, it's either gonna be an accepted ballot or a rejected ballot. There's no need to determine you know, if somebody voted in the wrong house district because it's a statewide race. And then all the ballots are sent to the bipartisan absentee review board and they have the final, they make the final determination. They'll review the work done by staff and determine if the right count code was applied to each ballot. And then they sit as teams and, um, um, you know, account for say a stack of 25, 50 envelopes and they will open them and remove the ballot from the envelope that contains the voter information and put those envelopes in a pile and the ballots in the secrecy sleeve in a pile, in a pile remove them and prepare them for counting. So there is no way for um, anybody to be able to associate a voted ballot with a voter. Thank you. The next one is just a comment. Division elections are my hero of my democracy. Um, next question, <laughs> the write-in candidate name is spelled wrong is it still going to be accepted? Well, um, there's case law on that. And as long as the division would be able to um, 
make a determination that it was for a qualified writing candidate, um, then it would be accepted as long as there was a way to, you know, if you mix the I and the E up or you put the L in front of an A, if it was similar enough to what the official name was of the candidate, yes, it would be. Okay. In the special and general elections for our, no, that's not really a question. This one, I think you've kind of answered. What happens if there was a major write-in candidate like Senator Murkowski in 2010, and the write-in group does not receive the least amount of votes after the first round? At that point, are the write-in vote getters counted and then eliminated individually? If they would be the, the top vote getter or the in, in second place within half of a percent difference from the number one, yes, we would have to look at each individual write-in and determine then from that point um, how which candidates get eliminated and how that would work, yes. Okay. Regarding the ballot mistake with in-person voting, do I understand correctly that the ballot box will spit the ballot out if it is overvoted, for instance, the person who voted the ballot should be there and offered the opportunity to spoil the ballot and mark another ballot correcting the mistake. That's correct. So the voter should wait for their ballot to be completely accepted in through by the tabulator. And if it is returned for some reason on the screen, it'll explain what the issue is. And they will have an opportunity to, to correct their ballot or they can, like I said earlier, they could just decide to accept their, um, their overvote or their error and feed the ballot on through. Hey, I live by myself. Can I have a friend be a witness signature? Yes, if they're age 18 or older. Okay, any more questions out there? I don't see any more um, showing up yet. Maybe we should wait just a minute to see if any more. There are a number of comments that I'm still, that I didn't, that are still showing up there, but um, concerns about ranked choice voting generally or, um, election fraud generally, but I think you've already addressed those. We, on the division's website under um, election security, I believe it is, we have a really good detailed um, document that describes all the different various processes of the division. And I really do encourage people to go to the website and look that up. And if you want, I can um, send the link to, to you guys and you could provide that to folks. Okay, it's very yeah. good information provide that, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's one more question. If you notify a voter of their ballot needing attention, you have to know how they voted, please explain. Well, there is not a cure process. I think that's what that's referring to. If we notify a voter, if we're by mail, <clears throat> there is no cure process. So if you um, overvoted your ballot and didn't follow the instructions that come with your ballot, then and your ballot is overvoted and you don't have an opportunity to fix it. If you forgot to sign your ballot envelope, if you didn't provide an identifier or didn't have a witness, there is no opportunity for cure. That's not provided for at this point in time in state law. Okay, another question's come in. If I had a number one and a number four choice only, could my number four choice be counted if that candidate survived the rounds? It would not because the law does not allow two sequentially skipped rankings. So only in that example, your candidate with, that you marked as your first choice would be the only viable candidate on that ballot and stay in the running as long as they were not eliminated. But at that point, the ballot, if your candidate for your first choice was eliminated in any of the first you know, three rounds, um, the ballot would then become inactivated. And that's a, that's a, that was written into the law. So you have to vote for number one and two in order right. to vote for. Yeah, so like in, in that situation, like Jason explained, if, if, you're, if you only wanna vote for two, mark one and two, don't mark one and three or one and four or two and four. Mark them in, you know, vote for them in, in your in sequential order, one and two. Um, you don't have to vote for three and four. Um, it, it just, it reduces the chance that your ballot will become inactive at some point. Okay, next question. Is the division able to send pollsters to help out communities that do not have trained pollsters in time for the August and November election days? 
sending out election workers? Is that what they're asking? Yeah, I think, can you send out people to train people in communities that don't have already trained people, I guess, is that what? Well, we provide election worker training to all of our um, election workers, and that'll start taking place for the August election in the months of uh, June and July. So then a comment, only in-person voting allows correction opportunities. Well, in your by mail voting, um, there's instructions with your ballot that if you make a mistake, you can draw a line through your mistake and then write the words no, and then go ahead and fill in the oval that for the corrected candidate that you want to vote for. And that ballot would be um, adjudicated. In other words, reviewed and a facsimile would be made of it to mark the ballot by the bipartisan absentee board um, to mark the ballot according to the voters intent. And there also is an opportunity, you can reach out to the Division of Elections if there is adequate time and say, I poured coffee all over my ballot, I need a new one, and we can send you another ballot. Well, it's called a replacement ballot, or you can opt to, if you've made a mistake, destroy your ballot, and you could go vote in person at um, any regional elections office. Okay, hey, in the upcoming primary, after I see my ballot, I vote it and mail it back. How do I know if the Division of Elections received my ballot? Well, we are we've <clears throat> we are using ballot tracks this for this special primary election, and it's similar. It is what the same system that the municipality of Anchorage used for their election. In fact, if you um, if any of you already opted in for that with the municipality of Anchorage's um, April election. You may have gotten a notice today that said your ballots on the way for the state election. So um, it will also then, if you signed up for that, provide you notices um, if it was um, returned as undeliverable to the division and when we've received it. So um, that information will be available to voters. And I did receive an email today that said my ballot went out. Yay. <laughs> I got a cool text. Yeah, great system. It's really uh, hopefully working uh, to a lot of people. It's really great. We were good. we were already planning to implement it for August, but with the special primary being all by mail, we just ramped it up and got it going in time for this election. I think it'll be very helpful to voters. Does everyone need a witness for their vote? Yes, they do. Okay, if a person applied for an absentee ballot with their ballot, for the special election go out today as well. If they applied, if they applied for density ballot for the regular primary or general election, we are mailing those ballots to the address they requested their ballot to be mailed to for those elections, yes. But every registered voter <clears throat> is being sent, um, was mailed a ballot today. This follows up on the question about um, notification of division of elections that their ballots been sent out or received. I don't live in, An in Anchorage, I live in Fairbanks. How do I sign up for the notification? We're gonna get information out to everybody tomorrow, but it's it's through ballot tracks and we'll have a link that you can go in and you can um, enter in your name, first name, last name, your year of birth and your, um, your mailing address zip code and um, how you want to receive messages by email, by phone calls or by text message. And we will have that information out um, tomorrow. And I'll just add that was very easy to do for the Anchorage election. And like you said, the, by registering for Anchorage, that automatically set, yeah, for the state election, which is great. Okay. I don't see any more questions coming in here. Unless, Kari, did you see anything I missed? If you can weigh in here, or I guess Jason and Gail can see the questions as well, so. Um, I don't see anything you missed. The only thing I would suggest is Gail and Jason, if you could make sure to send me all the links that you're planning on sharing, I'll make sure that everyone, all these attendees can get those, I'll email those on or out. Definitely we'll do that. Yeah. Jason or Gail, do you have any closing comments you wanna make? No, we just, you know, I thank you on behalf of the division for allowing us to be here. Um, as Jason said, this is the, one of the best ways that we can get the information out. If anybody has questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're, you know, that's what we're here for. We want to make sure you guys get the right information, the accurate information, and then 
perhaps maybe some of you can help be um, the voice on the ground to spread the information out to other groups that you belong to or family and friends. And um, we're here to help in any way we can. Yeah, just to echo that, really uh, appreciate the time. Um, and, you know, our group, the Division of Elections, we really are kind of going across the state, every group um, that wants a presentation or wants information. If you're a part of a group, please feel free to reach out and, and request either resources and you can share that or we're happy to give presentations. Um, as I mentioned, you know, this week we're, we're in Petersburg. Last week we were in Juneau. Week before that we were in Kodiak. Week before that, Kenai, we're in Fairbanks, we're going to Nome. We really want to talk to every Alaskan about that. And so, but we want to also make sure that people in those communities can help lead that information. And so um, if you are a part of a group um, that wants information, please reach out. And, and we know, you know, we recognize, especially from our group, through a ballot measure that sometimes people don't like these changes or people love these changes. But right now, we really are focused on just getting the correct information out to voters, uh, not, you know, happy to talk about the benefits or some of the, you know, sometimes the, the challenges about it, but really want to make sure that people know how to fill out their ballot um, and can share that information with others. So um, that's that's our number one charge. And we hope that that people understand that and want to help us out. So thank you. OK, and I'll make a final plug for election workers, just because I think that's a good way to gain confidence in the system because you realize when you work an election, you realize there's a lot of checks and balances and um, yeah, it's just, uh, and I'm like I say there, Gail is always looking for workers and you can sign up at the Division of Elections website. Um, the pay isn't real good, but. It's getting better though. It's getting better. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyhow, I wanna thank Gail and Jason for a very interesting and informative discussion missing from this Zoom event. It's the sound of the applause from everybody watching tonight. Special thanks to Kari Gardi, who has been running the Zoom show behind the scenes this evening. And thank you for your support in attending this evening. If you are not a member of Alaska Common Ground, please go to our website, akcommonground.org, to join or make a donation to support Alaska Common Ground's work towards an engaged democracy. Please stay healthy and engaged. Don't forget to vote and have a good evening. And thank you again, Gail and Jason. Thank you, everybody. Take care.